the Civic Auditorium in San Francisco, Audio Digest Surgery, Volume 16, Number 20, brings you a special report from one of the most important and instructive surgical meetings in the world, the American College of Surgeons' 55th Annual Clinical Congress. This year's five-day Congress has a registration of 10,791. That's professionals, with a record-breaking total registration of 17,375. The extensive scientific program encompasses the entire range of general surgery and the surgical specialties, including 258 research reports, some 50 panel discussions, 15 seminars, and 15 postgraduate courses, plus special sessions and the scientific and industrial exhibits. On this, the final day of the Congress, we join many others who've turned out for the What's New in Surgery session, as several distinguished surgeons summarize the important surgical findings presented during the Congress. Presiding over the session is Vanderbilt University's H. William Scott, Jr., who appears now ready to begin. Let's Ladies listen. and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this session on what's new in surgery. The forum committee, which has been responsible for organizing this program, has selected a series of highly representative experts in the fields involved to review with you what's new in the special fields that will be covered. The lead off speaker on cardiothoracic surgery, Dr. Rainey Williams, professor of surgery at the University of Oklahoma School of Medicine, Dr. Williams. Interest in cardiothoracic surgery has remained at a very high level and both the ingenuity and industry of numerous investigators is indeed impressive. One of the exciting developments to me in the field of cardiothoracic surgery is the imminent practical development of the membrane oxygenator. The membrane oxygenator has been discussed at college sessions for at least 15 years and such very elaborate machines as the Branson oxygenator which is used by Dr. Gabodi and a few others have been used. However, at this session, Dr. Lily High, Dr. Lande reported a practical, small, hopefully disposable membrane oxygenator, which has been used in animals for periods up to 48 hours without significant damage to blood, and which they reported at this session has been used in humans for prolonged periods of circulatory support. A second approach to the membrane oxygenator is the capillary membrane oxygenator, which was described by Austin and Buckley and their associates from the MGH. These are the characteristics of the intermediate size Buckley oxygenator. It has a reasonable flow for partial bypass. It has good characteristics with regard to oxygenation. It has an acceptable priming volume uh, and the damage to blood elements uh, in prolonged periods of experimental bypass has been very acceptable. A third type of membrane oxygenator, which is under development, was de described by Bartlett and Drinker and their associates also from Boston, and this being the toroidal membrane oxygenator, which depends upon tubal movement to constantly change the blood membrane layer. In the field of general support of the cardiac surgical patient and the conduct of bypass, there are a number of areas of activity which seem to be important. The first of these is with regard to myocardial ischemia. Now, numerous operations on the heart obviously involve periods of myocardial ischemia, and the importance uh, of this phenomenon has been debated. There was an interesting paper by Baluki, Lombardo, and Jude on the elaboration of an inotropic agent from ischemic myocardium, which is of both basic and perhaps practical interest. Sugg and his associates from Dallas have studied the late effects of myocardial ischemia on ventricular function and have demonstrated very conclusively that not only is there an immediate depression of ventricular function, but that this lasts for a matter of hours and perhaps even days. And the conclusion is inescapable that myocardial ischemia is not basically an acceptable phenomenon if it can be prevented. Munth and Austin and their associates presented a very fascinating study on modifying the effects on ventricular function by hypothermia and by asanguineous coronary perfusion. Marked depression of ventricular function after 60 minutes of ischemia and under normal thermic conditions. Some improvement with coronary perfusion, and this is asanguineous perfusion. A 
relatively satisfactory level of return of ventricular function simply by protecting the heart by hypothermia and a somewhat more marked protection of ventricular function by extreme hypothermia. Combination of hypothermia of four degrees type plus a sanguineous perfusion resulted in a nearly 90% return of ventricular function, which obviously could have considerable clinical importance. Now moving from ischemia to the question of coronary perfusion, there was an extremely interesting paper by Sokol and Austin and their associates demonstrating a disturbing fact. And this has to do with the demonstration that at perfusion pressures of below 80, there is a rather marked depression of myocardial function whereas above 80, the myocardial function remained relatively satisfactory. And I point this out because I think numerous bypass procedures are carried out at perfusion pressures, perhaps considerably below 80, and this may be a cause of difficulty. Of considerable practical value is the demonstration by Holland and McGinn of the efficacy of the Doppler flow meter in detecting arterial air embolism. Now, this has been an important cause of complications in cardiovascular surgery. Uh, these investigators have shown that the Doppler flow meter with a electrode applied to the skin is capable of detecting very small air emboli. The effect on the Doppler trace with a one milliliter of air injection. However, they also demonstrated that when the amount of air was reduced to less than one half of one tenth of a milliliter, there was also a detectable visual and trace change by the Doppler flow meter. A negative report in the forum, which seems to be of considerable importance, was the very nice study of Schenck and his associates demonstrating that hyperbaric oxygenation not only has no beneficial effect on the myocardium, but in effect reduces the myocardial utilization of oxygenation and therefore reduces any value which hyperbaric oxygenation might have in cardiac surgery. Now it's impossible to fail to realize how important automation and computer monitoring of patients may become. And such studies as that by Rosie and Lewis and their associates have demonstrated beyond question that very elaborate and sophisticated computer monitoring devices can be used without crowding the human personnel from the bedside. A good example of the sort of information that can be achieved is demonstrated by the paper of Kachukas and Kirkland in which using an inlying arterial cannula, continuous measurement of stroke volume can be recorded. It does require corroboration by other methods. The computer derived values for stroke volume during the first 24 hours after cardiac operations agrees very well with the more cumbersome dye dilution studies with a correlation coefficient of 95%. It also demonstrates that this is reduced in the second 24 hour period, but the implication is clear that one could, if necessary, derive a second constant for subsequent studies. Such studies have also been carried out by Black and Wiedner and others demonstrating the value of continuous computer monitoring. Now in terms of specific cardiac diseases and processes, it was both encouraging and discouraging that real clarification of the status of artificial valves was not forthcoming and it appears that each surgeon and each group has its own favorites for its own reasons. There is only one new valve presented which is certainly a first in the last several years at the Congress and this valve was nicely demonstrated by Kaiser and Litwack and Associates. It's a pig heterograph valve sewn uh, onto a malleable metal stent. Uh, this valve has been used by Kaiser primarily in patients who could not tolerate long-range anticoagulant therapy for one reason or another, and there have been no instances of late emboli in a series of approximately 20 patients in which it's been implanted. The area in which there appears to be the most interest and certainly the most rapid expansion in cardiovascular or cardiothoracic surgery is in the area of coronary artery disease. Now the two operations for revascularization that appear to have 
survived the numerous investigations over years are the bypass using autologous vein, which can be anastomosed to a rather small distal patent coronary artery and internal mammary implantation. The bypass operation was very nicely presented by the Cleveland Clinic group, and Dr. Sabiston, in a very handsome presentation, summarized the status of the coronary artery implants and uh, stated that the procedure is of value, although there are important questions regarding it, which to date remain unanswered. The excision of myocardial infarction in the acute stage continues to be of interest. This was discussed by Dr. Heimbecker uh, at one of the postgraduate sessions, and Dr. Heimbecker has a surviving patient. In the straw vote taken at the session, it was obvious from the survival rate that a good deal yet has to be learned about resection of acute myocardial infarction. And in fact, in the room, I think there were no surgeons with surviving patients. Now, support of the patient after acute myocardial infarction is obviously of value, and two methods were presented. One, the use of the membrane oxygenator, which has already been alluded to, and secondly, a paper presenting considerable clinical information by Butner and Kantrowitz and their group, demonstrating the value of diastolic augmentation or counterpulsation in the acute cardiogenic shock. And this method obviously deserves further attention as a matter of considerable promise. Now, in the field of congenital heart disease, a number of developments were reported. First, the group from Nashville appears to have solved the question posed by Dr. Scott uh, in excess of 20 years ago concerning the cause of hypertension and coarctation. A second paper of interest was that by Lynch and Rosencrantz using drugs to modify acute pulmonary hypertension. The very beautiful work by Magoon on the treatment of the truncus arteriosus, while not new at this session, is certainly of note. Dr. Magoon and his associates in 20 patients have operated on type 1 and 2 truncus abnormalities and have closed the very large ventricular septal defect with a patch and then used an aortic homograft with its valve intact and with the septal leaflet of the mitral valve still attached which is then sutured to the right ventriculotomy using the mitral valve to complete this suture line in order to maintain obliquity of the origin of the aortic homograph from the right ventricle. Now, this procedure offers hope to a group for which there was formerly very little or nothing that could be offered. Dr. Hallman and the group from Houston presented a nice presentation on the management of endocardial cushion defects. Their contention that the more complete endocardial cushion defects should be treated by excision rather than plastic repair of the malformed mitral valve with replacement by an artificial valve and then ultimately with closure of the atrial septal defect using a patch. This may well be a contribution in a very difficult area in the surgery of congenital heart disease. And finally, Mom presented a new series of thoughts on the very difficult problem of aortic insufficiency associated with ventricular septal defect. This work, which is new, will be published in the coming year, and I would suggest that those who are seriously interested in cardiovascular surgery will find it of considerable interest. In summary, it's been a busy year in which a number of answers have appeared. As usual, uh, the answers have generated more questions, and we'll look forward to the answers to these questions in the following year. Our number two speaker will discuss new developments in the area of shock and metabolism. This will be presented by Dr. Luis Del Garcio, Associate Professor of Surgery at Albert Einstein in New York City. Dr. Del Garcio. In the past few years, we have observed man emerge as the prime model for the study of shock syndromes. Investigators have recognized that the special centers within hospitals which are required for the up-to-date treatment of patients in shock also provide unique opportunities for clinical investigation of these patients. But clinical research, as compared to animal experimentation, has posed many problems. Among them, the wild profusion of variables and multi-system disease and the ever-present concern for patient safety, comfort, and dignity. The surgical mentality 
seems to have welcomed this sort of a challenge, and at this meeting, we have seen the emergence of some of the solutions to the problem. The panel discussion, moderated by Dr. Maloney, described some of the results of the systems analysis approach to intensive care and the monitoring of desperately ill patients. Doctors Gaysford, Kinney, Moore, and Kirkland were in agreement that electronic data processing will be of importance in relieving physicians and nurses from the chores of recording and calculating. And it was shown that computers can do more than that for the treatment of the patient in shock. And Dr. Frank Gerbode, in a postgraduate course, showed how analysis of data from respiratory and vascular sensors provides an online, real-time assessment of cardiorespiratory function. And this approach, for example, can provide an immediate explanation for a sudden arrhythmia that may develop so that proper, specific corrective measures can be taken. A number of papers from the forum also described systems and devices for physiologic monitoring in man. Dr. Peter Rossi and John Lewis and their co-workers, as pointed out by Dr. Williams, stressed a versatile, modular approach coordinated by means of a relatively small digital computer. And the ongoing search for a reliable means of continuously measuring cardiac output in man focused on the digital analysis of the central arterial pressure contour analyzed by John Kirkland's group at the University of Alabama. They pointed out that the changes in the arterial distensibility alter the relationship between stroke volume and the phasic pressure pulse. And this requires changing the proportionality constant during the patient's clinical course. Dr. Michael Widener and his colleagues at the Medical College of South Carolina gave a favorable report on the clinical trials of a relatively simple device requiring only peripheral arterial cannulation. Uh, the cardiac output trend module, as it is called, produces a signal which varies directly with the cardiac output and is based upon the difference between the diastolic and mean arterial blood pressure. The general trend in the area of monitoring is really the search for a safe, non-invasive, reliable sensor to match the capabilities of electronic data processing. The question of myocardial contractile force in hemorrhagic shock was investigated in dogs by Friedman and his co-workers. Direct recordings from isometric force transducers applied to the left ventricle indicated slight depression of the myocardial contractility in irreversible hemorrhagic shock. Now, this correlates with the work of Yarborough and others at the Medical College of South Carolina, which showed that dogs surviving two hours of oligemic hypotension did so because of increased coronary blood flow and decreased coronary vascular resistance. And this increase was not related to other hemodynamic or metabolic responses in the shock preparation. Both of these papers indicate the need for new methods to study the human heart in shock. Now we'll jump to the business end of the circulation in shock, the tissue function and capillary transport. A forum paper by Moss, Irv, and Schumer uh, described Warburg apparatus studies on the effect of endotoxin on mitochondrial respiration to determine whether endotoxin causes uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation oxygen uptake of mitochondria given exogenous substrate with and without endotoxin were compared. Apparently, certain endotoxins in vitro are capable of uncoupling phosphorylation from respiration. But unlike classical chemical uncouplers, they also exert a profound inhibitory effect on the electron transport system. And such basic work as this is of great importance in the interpretation of clinical data in septic shock regarding oxygen transport and indirect evidence of anaerobic metabolism presented at the forum in previous years. Lewis and Appelgren described an interesting new technique for measuring capillary transport function in skeletal muscle. The method, which is applicable to humans, utilizes the simultaneous intramuscular injection of two isotopes, I-131 and Xenon-133. There is one scintillation detector linked to two parallel spectrometer rate meter systems. The application of this method should clear up some of the questions regarding arteriovenous shunting 
uh, versus cellular malfunction in human septic shock. Hermreck and Thal used a septic hind limb preparation model to study the effects of vasoactive drugs on blood flow and oxygen utilization. Now, these studies suggest that septic and non-septic tissue respond similarly to pharmacologic agents. A dissociation between oxygen consumption and blood flow in septic tissue was found and believed due to shunting. Interestingly, Phenoxybenzamine, the alpha adrenergic blocking agent of wide renown, was found not to affect blood flow in the septic leg. The pulmonary circulation in shock was not ignored by the forum. An elegant study by Harrison, Hinshaw, Kowalson, and Greenfield showed that the lung sustains immediate damage after gram-negative septicemia with decreased surfactant and widespread alveolar and endothelial cellular injury. The prompt fall of pulmonary venous oxygen tension suggests that early pulmonary arterial venous shunting is a prominent feature of septic shock in man. Uh, this correlates well with the clinical findings that hypoxemia is a sensitive early indicator in human septic shock. A review of topics in the area of shock therapy reveals that no concept has spurred as much discussion an experimental work as Shire's postulation of the deficit in extracellular water volume associated with hemorrhagic shock and trauma. The observations suggested a deficit beyond that caused by blood loss, and controversy has resulted from the difficulty of measuring that vaguely defined compartment, the extracellular water space. A separation of extracellular water into an anatomic area and a lesser compartment termed the functional or physiologically active extracellular water has further compounded the problem. Several forum papers dealt with this question. Matthews and Douglas attempted to define the magnitude and direction of change of the functional extracellular fluid and total extracellular fluid in shock by means of long equilibration curves for radiosulfate S35. Now they found that treatment of severe shock with blood alone corrected the total extracellular fluid, but not the reduced functional extracellular fluid. Blood plus a balanced salt solution corrected both fluid volumes. In the discussion which followed, Kirkland and Maloney criticized the interpretation of the isotope data uh, pointing out that the indicators penetrate the cell uh, by way of the invaginations and fenestrations of the cell membrane, and that the kinetics of the system suggest an infinite number of exponentials in the disappearance slope of the extravascular indicators, rather than a two or three, in contrast to another paper by Matthews and co-workers. Uh, they believe that their demonstration of three rates of the diffusion of radiosulfate are best explained by early mixing and diffusion into the functional space and later slow diffusion into the total sulfate space. Shizgal and Gutilius used the aldosterone secretion rate as an indirect measure of fluid volume depletion in surgical patients. The postoperative use of a liter or so of isotonic saline reduced the aldosterone secretion rate from 102% over control values to 12%. In summary, the general consensus of opinion was that modest amounts of balanced salt solutions are needed in addition to blood following shock and trauma. Other possible therapeutic measures of benefit in shock were suggested by the work of Drucker and his group at the University of Toronto. In a study of the role of catecholamines and energy metabolism during hemorrhagic shock, they found a rise followed by a fall in plasma levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine. The decline in plasma catecholamines during shock may permit better utilization of exogenous glucose, which can be given along with insulin as a substrate for energy metabolism in shock. A glucose and insulin metabolism during shock was the subject of another forum paper by Egdahl and his co-workers. They reported glucose and insulin changes similar to those in diabetes with a decreased glucose disappearance rate during intravenous glucose tolerance tests and abnormal insulin responses. Now, these findings also suggest that it might be possible to favorably manipulate intermediary metabolism in shock by the infusion of insulin.
Another team, under the direction of Agdal, reported on the effect of prolonged hypotension on the increased corticosteroid secretion in hemorrhage. Using their technique of adrenal vein sampling, they found that a minimal adrenal perfusion volume of one milliliter per minute was required for normal adrenal function after shock. As long as this minimal level of perfusion was maintained, adrenal function returned to normal, even in irreversible shock. Since it required five hours of perfusion below this minimal value to produce impaired adrenal function in dogs, adrenal insufficiency is not likely to occur in clinical hemorrhagic shock states. From the standpoint of the prevention of shock in susceptible, debilitated patients, one of the greatest advances in recent years was the use of total intravenous hyperalimentation described by Dudrick in one of the postgraduate courses on pre- and post-operative care. He showed that nutrients can be administered in amounts exceeding basal requirements by 200%. Over 500 patients were treated by this technique and maintained in positive nitrogen balance. Forty infants so treated maintained normal growth and development. The basic mixture infused is hypertonic and consists of 20% glucose, 5% protein hydrolysate, vitamins, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and chloride. Adult patients are gradually brought up to 24-hour volumes of 5 liters infused through meticulously cared for central venous catheters. Once again, attention to detail and reliance on fundamental principle wins the day in surgical care. And this sort of approach to the preparation of high-risk patients for surgery and the monitoring methods described at the beginning of this review will prevent shock or lead to its early recognition. Now, there were no dramatic breakthroughs in the area of shock and metabolism this year, but this sort of progress will result in the saving of many lives. The proceedings have paused momentarily, long enough for me to say that this doctor is the end of this side of your reel. On side B, the remainder of this special report from the American College of Surgeons 55th Annual Clinical Congress. Continuing a special report from the What's New in Surgery session at the American College of Surgeons 55th Annual Clinical Congress, this is Audio Digest Surgery, Volume 16, Number 20. H. William Scott, Jr., presiding over the session, is now ready to resume. Dr. Marshall Orloff is going to tell us about what's new in gastrointestinal biliary conditions. Dr. Orloff is professor and chairman of the Department of Surgery at the University of California at San Diego. Marshall? This past year of 1969 has been an active one in investigation, and there has been a great deal of activity in the area of research in liver physiology and liver disease. There have been some remarkable advances in certain areas, while in some other areas, uh, little progress has occurred. Without question, the most promising new developments have been in the field of liver transplantation. Uh, over 100 liver transplants have now been performed in humans, and the success rate has started to become significant. Starzl and his colleagues in Denver and Kahn and his associates in England have had the largest experience with human liver transplantation and have made the most significant contributions to knowledge. The vast majority of cases uh, have involved orthotopic replacement of the host liver. Heterotopic or auxiliary transplantation has received little attention and has not yet been successfully accomplished in man, in large part because of technical problems. Orthotopic replacement of the liver for primary or secondary cancer has been successfully performed in a number of cases. However, persistence or recurrence of the cancer has occurred consistently, and in some cases it has appeared that the tumor growth was stimulated by the transplantation procedure so that it is doubtful that hepatoma will continue to serve as an indication for liver transplantation.
On the other hand, cirrhosis of the liver is on the increase in this country, and it was announced recently that it has become the fourth ranking cause of death, and so the cirrhotic population represents a huge reservoir of patients who may be potentially benefited by liver transplantation. In the transplantation procedure, the development of areas of focal necrosis and abscesses, particularly in the right lobe of the liver graft, has been a frequent complication. Initially, it was believed that this was due to kinking of the hepatic artery, but further experience has suggested to Starzl and his group that it is more often due to rejection of the graft and it can be reversed by intensifying the immunosuppression therapy. In an interesting study of uh, homograft sex and of gamma globulin phenotypes, Kashiwagi and his associates in the Denver group reported that the Kupfer cells in the liver assume the sex of the host, while the vascular endothelial cells uh, retain their original sex. During 1969, disappointingly little progress was made in the important matter of liver preservation for transplantation. Uh, this year, no paper was presented at the Clinical Congress on this very important subject. A consistent method of preserving the liver for 12 or more hours for subsequent transplantation has not yet been developed, and wide clinical application of liver transplantation awaits such a development. The role of blood supply in liver regeneration and the existence of a trophic factor in portal venous blood remain subjects of controversy that have become all the more important as a result of interest in auxiliary liver transplantation. Sun Lee and his associates reported detailed studies of regeneration of auxiliary liver isografts which show that a portal venous blood supply is necessary for regeneration. And grafts which were dually vascularized by the hepatic artery and the inferior vena cava and therefore were presumed to have a very large systemic afferent blood supply atrophied. Now, the factor of host liver competition was not studied and the possible importance of this factor provides a basis for continuing the controversy about the essentiality of portal blood for liver regeneration, a controversy which has gone on now for about 40 years. The treatment of portal hypertension and bleeding esophageal varices has continued to stimulate the imagination and ingenuity of surgeons. And despite the impressive improvement in immediate survival associated with porticable shunt, particularly when it is used as an emergency, a search for better ways of decompressing the liver and splanchnic circulation has continued mainly because of the side effects such as encephalopathy which are sometimes associated with the direct porticable shunt procedure. Selective portosystemic shunts such as the distal splenorenal anastomosis of Warren and his colleagues and the side-to-side -side splenorenal shunt under study by Britton and his group have received further trial during the past year, but experience is really insufficient to warrant conclusions. Measures directed at temporarily reducing portal pressure in emergency circumstances, such as selective mesenteric arterial infusion of petrescin and shunts from the umbilical vein to the systemic circulation, have continued to receive sporadic attention on the premise that the bleeding cirrhotic patient can be prepared for definitive therapy. In this regard, uh, Kessler, Tice, and Zimmon at the forum reported that an extracorporeal pump was required to significantly reduce portal pressure in an umbilico-systemic shunting system so that temporary bypass is not as simple as was originally hoped, and thus far, it has not been demonstrated to significantly influence the mortality rate of the bleeding cirrhotic population. Studies on the pathogenesis of ascites in cirrhosis and on the important role of the lymphatic system in acidic fluid formation have continued. 
Witte and his associates on the basis of quantitative protein studies reported that the old notion that ascites is due to decreased plasma oncotic pressure is wrong and that the primary cause of acidic fluid transudation is increased hydrostatic pressure in the liver and splanchnic bed. Intense interest in the unsolved problem of portal systemic encephalopathy and hepatic coma continues, mainly because research during the past 15 years has failed to elucidate the causes or provide satisfactory treatment. The role of ammonia intoxication in the pathogenesis of hepatic coma is as uncertain today as it was two decades ago. Research into the treatment of hepatic coma during the past years has largely consisted of attempts to develop ex vivo hepatic support systems by extracorporeal perfusion through an isolated animal liver, an isolated human liver, or most recently, through a live baboon. After extensive trials in humans with hepatic coma involving over 200 cases, it cannot be said that any of these techniques has improved patient survival or significantly modified the course of the underlying liver disease. Gale, Williams, and Hume reported that five of six patients in hepatic coma treated by cross-circulation with a baboon failed to survive. Moreover, five of the six baboons died from what these workers interpreted to be a hyperacute rejection response to the human blood. It seems very likely that the successful treatment of hepatic coma will involve another approach, a different approach than the one which has been explored so thoroughly during the past few years. During the past year, the important role of the liver in the regulation of gastric secretion has been clearly established. It has been conclusively demonstrated that the intestinal phase of gastric secretion and the gastric acid hypersecretion associated with porticable shunt are mediated by a potent humoral agent. Further, it has been shown for the first time that shunted humans develop profound gastric acid hypersecretion in response to food in the intestines, just as do shunted dogs. Now, in the field of gastric physiology and disease during the past year, there has been a very exciting advance, one which I think will profoundly influence the course of this important field. This advance to which I refer has been the development of an accurate radioimmunoassay technique for the measurement of gastrin in biological fluids and tissues by McGuigan. This technical achievement has made it possible to study the site of origin of the hormone gastrin, the metabolism of gastrin, the role of gastrin output in digestion, and the blood levels of gastrin in disease. It has been shown by McGuigan that blood gastrin levels in man are elevated in conditions associated with end organ failure, such as pernicious anemia and gastric cancer and that the gastrin levels increase with age. Furthermore, it has been demonstrated by a number of workers that the zollinger ellison syndrome is consistently accompanied by markedly elevated blood gastrin levels so that the measurement of gastrin in peripheral blood has become the best method of diagnosing the zollinger ellison syndrome. At the surgical forum this year, Charters, Reeder, and Thompson reported on studies of tissue gastrin levels in dogs and in man, which showed that the hormone is present, as expected, in large quantities only in the antrum of the stomach. Concentrations of gastrin in the gastric fundus, in the duodenum, and in the jejunum were very small. Jaffe and Newton studied the fate of injected gastrin labeled with I-125 and showed that it has a short circulating half-life, a low urinary clearance, and significant sequestration in the kidney cortex. Undoubtedly, during this coming year, we will witness a great amount of research activity on gastrin, and perhaps for the first time during this century, uh, we'll develop a clear understanding of the physiology of gastric secretion.
Another important area in gastric physiology and disease that has continued to receive attention is that of the gastric defense mechanism against acid and ulcer, the so-called mucus barrier. And our concept of ulcer formation, I think, is evolving toward an appreciation that ulceration represents the balance between attack, the acid peptic factor, and defense, the uh, factor or factors which keep the mucosa in every one of us from being eroded every day. In further studies of uh, this defense mechanism, this uh, mucus barrier, Max and Menge reported that ACTH and cortisol reduced the turnover rate of gastric mucosal epithelial cells. Since continuous renewal of gastric mucosal cells is necessary for the protection of the stomach against injury, it's possible that ACTH and adrenal corticoids reduce the protective capacity of the mucus barrier by this mechanism. Previously, Menge and his group had demonstrated that adrenal corticoids impair the secretion of gastric mucus, and now they have demonstrated that these substances also impair the turnover rate of epithelial cells so that we have the beginning of a solid theory for why stress ulcer and ulcer caused by ACTH and corticoids develops in the stomach. Significant research work in the fields of biliary and pancreatic physiology was not evident at the Clinical Congress uh, this year or in the surgical literature. However, a study of practical clinical importance concerning deliberate drainage of the biliary system in the treatment of liver trauma was reported a few days ago by Lucas and his associates at this meeting. Now, these authors found a two-fold increase in mortality and intra-abdominal abscess formation when patients with liver injuries were subjected to biliary drainage. In dog experiments, biliary drainage failed to effectively reduce intrahepatic pressure and did not influence mortality rate or abscess formation in animals with a standard liver injury. The results of this detailed study provide a strong argument against the use of deliberate biliary drainage as an ad adjunct to the therapy of liver trauma. As you know, several years ago, uh, Merendino and his workers, on the basis of theoretical considerations, proposed that the common bile duct should be drained in injuries to the liver. And uh, that proposal has caught on and I think has received wide application. To my knowledge, this was the first detailed scientific analysis of that proposal and it showed that the theoretical basis for the proposal really uh, could not be substantiated, nor could the clinical application in terms of results. Interest in the use of small bowel bypass procedures for control of hypercholesterolemia and for correction of obesity continued during the past year. Buckwald and his associates at Minnesota added to their already large experience with the use of partial ileal bypass in the treatment of hypercholesterolemia, an experience which now exceeds 70 patients over the past six years. In addition, Buckwald and his colleagues reported that partial ileal bypass in children with familial hypercholesterolemia did not interfere with growth and development, lowered serum cholesterol levels to normal, and caused healing of arteriosclerotic plaques. It would seem that the partial ileal bypass procedure is here to stay. Regarding the use of massive intestinal bypass, that is, jejunum to distal ileum, to control obesity, a significant study by uh, Lanier and his associates at Vanderbilt reported the results of metabolic studies in nine morbidly obese patients treated by this procedure. All of the patients lost weight, but many of them developed nutritional defects, and some developed hepatomegaly due to fatty infiltration of the liver. Treatment of obesity by intestinal bypass of this type must still be considered an experimental procedure which requires continued careful evaluation 
before it can be accepted for regular use in patients. The last presentation will review new developments in the field of urology. Dr. Vincent J. O'Connor, Jr. of Chicago, Associate Professor of Urology at Northwestern, will present this topic. Now, this has been a rather outstanding session for urologic surgery this year, uh, with an excellent postgraduate course, uh, excellent general sessions, and particularly an excellent lecture by Dr. Victor Marshall on urology as a tight little island. Dr. Marshall's concept is that urology, rather than tightening up as a small island, should expand back into the sphere of general surgery. And I think all of the presentations this year show the interrelationship between urologic surgery and the other disciplines of general surgery. The forum again this year brings in what is new in clinical and experimental research. Several reports in other sessions which have not yet been mentioned bear special interest to us in urology. And I think one of the more important ones was in the metabolic section where Jeremy from West Virginia produced rather marked arteriosclerosis involving the coronary and renal arteries in rats under several regimens, basically giving them dehydrotachysterol and then doing orchiectomy and giving them estrogen. The rats who received only orchiectomy did not get this marked arteriosclerotic disease. All of this suggests and is pertinent to our current feelings with regard to estrogen in the treatment of prostatic cancer. And studies such as this have reinforced our search for other compounds which are anti-androgenic in nature, but which may or may not have the deleterious side effects of estrogen. And one of the studies in the forum by Walsh and Giddies from UCLA is most significant using ciproterone acetate, which is a new anti-androgenic compound which is now currently being used in clinical trials in treating prostatic cancer. In the castrate rat, growth of the ventral prostate resulting from testosterone, but more significantly resulting from androstenedione or dehydroepiandrosterone, or particularly prolactin and ACTH, can be countered by the administration of ciproterone acetate. In other words, this suggests that we may now be coming up with drugs which not only inhibit the testosterone directly, but the products of the adrenal as well as the pituitary stimulation. And this may well explain some of the reasons why we've seen occasional benefit from hypophysectomy or adrenalectomy in patients with advanced prostatic cancer. Another aspect of this, of course, is whether or not these particular drugs will have this atherogenic activity, as has been demonstrated with estrogen. And along this same line, I think two excellent studies from Dr. Scott's laboratory are pertinent to us who are interested in renovascular surgery, uh, mainly the demonstration that vein grafts seem to be more susceptible to atherosclerosis than either prosthetic or autogenous artery material. Another study in another section was the confirmation of the concept that renin is important in the hypertension associated with coarctation. There are two conflicting studies, and I think we are more inclined to accept that emanating again from Dr. Scott's laboratory, showing elevation of peripheral renin activity under a better method and with changes which we've now found are important in elevating the renin, which we all believe to be important in hypertension. Again, another study in the metabolic forum was kind of interesting to us. Uh, Cohen from Tulane showing reversal of renal hypertension by renoportal venous shunt. This technique, which was first studied by Levy and Blaylock and Child and Glenn in 1938, is still of questionable value. In the urology forum, a study by Gregory and Murphy showed that renal nerves uh, have some modifying interest in the renin released from the kidney. In other words, by denervating the kidney, as we do in transplantation, renin release can be modified in the sense that hypertensive hemorrhage 
produces an elevation of renin production directly from the kidney. The lack of advances in perfusion techniques of the kidney. Dr. Martin's study showing that simple cooling is probably as effective as perfusion at least up to eight hour periods. Uh, Dr. Nanninga from Northwestern presented evidence that furosemide instilled into the kidney may allow longer protection. Chapman from Seattle furthered some studies that were reported by McDonald 15 years ago uh, confirming the importance of urine in the induction of bladder tumors. Paraffin pellets uh, implanted in the bladder, uh, which as you know do produce tumors at quite a high rate, will only do this if urine comes in contact with them, suggesting that there is some substance in so-called bad urine uh, responsible for the development of these tumors in spite of the chemical being present. This may be glucuronidase or some other enzyme splitting off the conjugated compound as it appears in the urine. Urinary diversion occupied a good bit of the sessions, uh, suggesting that we do not have an ideal method for supravesical urinary diversion. The bladder cancer postgraduate course was quite good. There were several reports suggesting that the long-term results of chemotherapy such as 5-FU are not as promising as we had hoped. The concept which I think is becoming more evident this year is the low-dose preoperative irradiation uh, followed by a cystectomy in advanced uh, or at least infiltrating bladder tumors. The session on neurogenic bladder was quite interesting in that Dr. Komar has studied a series of patients now with acute spinal cord injuries using the technique described by Gutman in England of self catheterization, an improvement on intermittent catheterization of the acute spinal cord injury patient. This is a rather new and radical concept, which I think is going to be more accepted over the country as a means of treating patients with acute spinal cord injuries. The other study, which was fascinating in its concept, was that of Caro and Thompson, suggesting that in ureterosigmoidostomy, the ascending infection of bacteria or the progression of bacteria from the sigmoid could be neutralized perhaps by interposing a segment of gastric mucosa. In other words, using the gastric pouch which Seneco presented here in the forum in 1956. In their studies, the interposition of acid secreting gastric mucosa, which surprisingly brought the pH down in the range of one and at the highest up to three, uh, did not prevent the ascent of infection or prevent pyelonephritis. And finally, the testicle was studied uh, in a panel on male fertility and was also subject of a study by Farrington uh, showing the suppression of spermatogenesis associated with maldescent of the testicle. And it was interesting that the percent of involvement or damage was more closely related to the position of the testicle. In other words, the higher uh, the more damage and the further descended the less damage. Uh, in spite of this, uh, at the particular sessions on undescended testes, it was more or less agreed that the ideal time for bringing these undescended testes down it was about four years, suggesting that further damage occurs the longer one waits. On the part of the forum committee, I'd like to thank all of the discussers. That concludes our program. And may we add our thanks to the speakers and to the Board of Regents of the American College of Surgeons for cooperation in recording and disseminating this material. In your next issue of Audio Digest Surgery, one of the many clinically valuable panel discussions presented at this year's ACS Congress. Audio Digest Surgery is produced twice each month by the Audio Digest Foundation as a nonprofit subsidiary of the California Medical Association. All material in this program is copyrighted, and further tape duplication without permission is expressly prohibited.